today, I want to derive the clausius clapeyron equation, and I'm going to do it from the first and second laws of thermodynamics. This is a little bit unusual, as most people might derive the equation starting with Gibbs energy. Instead, we're going to proceed from the first and second law and get to Gibbs energy. That's just a little bit more thorough and probably something that you would never see on a test, except perhaps as individual questions. This graph shows the final equation that we are going to derive. It's a graph of saturated vapor pressure over ice. It could have been saturated vapor pressure over water just as easily, but it's saturated vapor pressure over ice. This is the maximum vapor pressure that would exist above some ice at some particular temperature before the water or gas molecules or ice molecules decided to stay on the ice rather than fly into the vapor. The curve represents the temperature and pressure at which the two phases, ice and vapor, are in equilibrium. The data points come from the 55th edition of the Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. And the blue curve is fitted for the constant A. Now, it, the constant A can actually be calculated directly from the math that I'm going to show. But you don't get quite as good of an answer everywhere, and fitting is probably a better way to go. I have written the first law as the differential of internal energy is equal to the change in heat plus the change in work. Internal energy is represented by the letter U and heat by the letter Q. In this convention, work W added to the system is positive, but you may remember it as being negative. Almost unbelievably, different universities teach it both ways. We're usually safe in thinking that the system does the work, and thus work is negative pressure times change in volume. It's interesting to me to note that whether you write the first law with a plus or a minus sign in front of the DW, that when you change it to PDV, the PDV will be negative. The second law is the one you've heard so much about, where we say that entropy always increases, and then we say entropy can be thought of as disorder and that the universe is always less becoming less orderly. Here we aren't going to think about that at all. We're instead going to write that delta S will be equal to or greater than delta Q over temperature. In other words, we don't have to try to understand it. Just notice that it boils down to a simple statement that the change in heat, dQ, is TDS, where S is entropy. Enthalpy is one of those words that unless you're an air conditioning repairman or a heat engineer that you've tried hard to forget. At constant pressure, enthalpy is internal energy plus the amount of energy needed to shove the atmosphere out of the way and make room for an expanding system. Often this expansion is negligible, and at constant pressure, enthalpy is just heat. I've rearranged the enthalpy definition to show that internal energy U is equal to enthalpy minus pressure volume. I did that because that's the context in which we're going to use this enthalpy equation. Now, if enthalpy wasn't part of your daily vocabulary, Gibbs energy is going to be nearly incomprehensible. Gibbs energy is the amount of enthalpy that is actually available to do work. Remember, we can't take heat all the way down to absolute zero. Indeed, when it comes to doing work with a heat engine, we can't even convert the temperature difference between two heat reservoirs into 100% useful work. Fortunately for our purpose, we don't care about any of that. The only thing of any importance is the rearranged second line showing that enthalpy is G plus TS. Now I've restated the first law with no change, and we're going to proceed to derive the Gibbs equation. In line one, I've substituted in the definition for enthalpy seen above, as well as the definition for heat and the definition for work. In line two, I've expanded the left side by taking the derivative of PV. There's nothing here except third grade math with calculus. Step three and four are purely algebra. We're canceling the work term, the minus PDV, and then we're moving the minus VDP term over to the right-hand side. 
In line five, I've restated the Gibbs definition because I'm about to use it. And then I'm going to substitute it in for DH so that we get the derivative of G plus TS on the left side. Line seven is another differentiation. This is identical to line two in terms of the operation. We're taking the derivative this time of TS and writing it down on the left side. So this gives us DG plus TDS plus SDT. In line eight, just like before in line three, we're going to cancel the like terms. In this case, it's TDS that appears on both sides of the equation. In line nine, we rearrange what's left and get an expression for Gibbs energy in terms of pressure and temperature. Clausius's goal was to relate pressure and temperature, and we're getting there. We've just done a Legendre transform to create Gibbs energy from the first law. It takes about three weeks at MIT to get this far. In line 10, I've taken the right-hand side of line 9 and written it to show ice on the left and gas or vapor on the, on the right. This was Clapeyron's big deal. He recognized that at equilibrium, the two phases, ice and vapor, would have to have equal energy and could therefore be equated. In line 11, we've just done a little algebra to rearrange the terms so that we've put volume on the left and entropy on the right. In line 12, we've done a little algebra to put the differentials on the left side of the equation, and then the constant terms are expressed as differences on the right. This is the Clapeyron differential equation. We take for granted that when delta G, shown in line 9, is 0, that we're at equilibrium. But Clapeyron died in 1864, and Willard Gibbs was just getting his Ph.D., Gibbs didn't develop and publish his work until the 1870s. At that time, equating the phase energies took a fair bit of insight. Another difficulty for Clapeyron was that delta S, as we know it, was introduced by Clausius in 1865, but Clapeyron died in 1864. So Clapeyron's derivation didn't follow the one I've shown, and indeed, he derived the blue term shown in the slide, which is, of course, equivalent since delta H over T is equal to delta S. The graph shows that the slope at any point is delta S over delta V, which is true and useful, but the form in which we will finally get the equation will not have delta V in it, and thus direct differentiation will yield a different slope, albeit an equal one. So what did Rudolf Clausius do? Well, for one thing, he out-engineered Clapeyron by making clever approximations. In line one, I'm replacing delta S with delta H over T. This is what Clapeyron already did, but this derivation is slightly closer to the one used by Clausius. In line two, Clausius made an approximation, namely that the volume of gas is so much larger than the volume of ice that he could safely change delta V to the volume of gas only. One mil of ice is 1,250 mils of water vapor at standard pressure and temperature, and a whole lot more as the pressure goes down a little. In line three, we're going to change volume into RT over P, i.e. use the ideal gas law and treat the dilute vapor as an ideal gas. At human temperatures and pressure, this is a pretty good approximation. Line four is nothing but algebra. I have consolidated the pressure terms on the left and the temperature terms on the right. I've also expressed the two temperature terms as T squared. In line five, the only thing I've done is draw integral symbols on both sides and move the constant terms out of the integral. We're going to use an old-fashioned way to solve a differential equation. Here, I've integrated the left side to get a log of the pressures, and we've integrated the right side to get a difference of temperatures. I'm not going to go through the detail of the integration, although it is shown here. This is probably not the venue to learn calculus. 
In this line, I've merely raised both sides of the equation to the power of e, the base of the natural logarithm. On the left side, it made the log go away and left the ratio. On the right, it gave a sum of exponents, which can be expressed as a product. Now I've moved p1 to the right and then replaced p times the exponent with a constant a. If we know exactly some p1 and t1, then a could be calculated rather than fitted, but then any dependence of delta h on temperature would really show up. So we end up with the clausius clapeyron equation derived with little more than the first law of thermodynamics. In the MIT thermodynamics course, this is about five weeks in. In a good physical chemistry text, you get to this point in about the fourth or fifth chapter. Now it turns out that the fitted equation over ice, which is basically sublimation, is really quite good. The curve passes right through the data points. Here's a different graph of the curve with the pressure range expanded and the temperature range lowered a little bit. And, um, and also this is graphed in Pascals instead of uh, Militor, even though I have marked a couple of Militor places on here. You can see that for all data points, the curve goes right through the data point. Here's a graph of the same curve over a different temperature range. In particular, it's water over water vapor. So the temperature goes from 0 degrees C to 100 degrees C. The first thing that we see is that the blue curve doesn't come anywhere near as good to fitting the data points. Indeed, while I've made them fit at the leftmost and rightmost parts of the graph, they really don't even hit the data points in the middle. We know that delta H is a function of temperature, and we learned from the prior graphs that that when you have ice, delta H is fairly constant at 51,102 joules per mole K. If you look up online, you'll probably find that a delta H for water is usually quoted at 100 degrees at 40,660 joules per mole K. In order to get a best fit, I had to use quite a compromise of 43,278. What probably needs to be done is to go back and integrate the equation considering delta H as a function of temperature, although that could lead to quite a messy result. So that's all I have for you today. I just wanted you to see how this derivation was done. If you found the video useful, leave me a comment. Thank you.